Good morning. Hello. Hey. Everybody doing okay this morning? I'm doing well. Both my feet are working, my lungs. So it's a good sign. Good sign. I've got a picture up here on the board. Does that bring back memories to anybody? Let's make a deal. All right. And who was the guy that was behind that? You remember? Monty Hall. Okay, made it famous, and and I was telling your, um, your wife here a little bit ago, he always had a choice. You know, he said, "What's take your choice. What's behind door number one, door number two, door number three, right? And people would pick, and they would show another door, and then he would turn around, do you want to change doors? Remember that? Famous. Do you want to swap doors? Some people would, some people wouldn't. And what was interesting uh over the years, there have been a lot of mathematicians study the probability whether you were better off keeping your door or switching it. And it's always an interesting debate. I think they said it's, I think it was, you're better off switching it for some reason. Even though mathematically it wasn't correct, it's just the way it was. So I don't know if there's something going on behind the scenes of that program or not. But it was a very interesting pre uh, you know, a premise on the program. Very, very simple. Three things, pick one. And you never knew what was behind it. And there was a lot of people who won a lot of stuff, and there was a lot of people that lost a lot of stuff. Now, has anybody in here ever been on that program? Nobody. Anybody in here ever kind of play it? Yeah, kind of play it. You know, and it, yeah, we used to play it, okay. And, and it, we, a lot of times we have families kind of play something very similar to it at Christmas time. You know, we take all the gifts, we wrap them up, we throw them in a pile, somebody picks one out, then the next person picks, and you can either take that, the previous one, or take the new one. So you never know what's going on. But when it comes down to this Monty Hall game, Believe it or not, everybody in here plays this game every day of your life. Every day of your life, you have to make choices, don't you? You have to make choices. And some are good, and some are not so good. You know, like, uh, well, there's Route 33 over here. Nice road and this and that. And you can take and travel up and down that road all you wish. And then there is actually a maximum little speed limit that they have on that thing. And you can get as close to it as you want. And you may even at times, like a lot of people do, exceed said limit. And then you may or may not have to argue with the boys in gray. And that's a choice that you make. But, and, and it's not a major choice. Yeah, you might lose a couple hundred dollars, but at least, you know, life goes on and you get to do it again. But if you decided that you wanted to play British and drive on the other side of the road, those consequences and that choice may prove to be very, very dire. But I'm going to talk about a person in the Bible it was Joseph. We're going to take a look at Genesis 37, 23. And it says, And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren that they, stripped, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishlamites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit if, it, if we stay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishlamites. And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, 
and his brother were content. Then there passed by Midianite merchants, and they drew him and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph in to Egypt. A lot of us know that from childhood. I'm going to skip down to verse 36. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and of the captain of the guard. Go to verse 39. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, and an Egyptian, brought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which he had brought him down thither. And the Lord said unto Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptians. And the master saw that the Lord was with him, that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hands. And Joseph found grace in, the, in his sight and served him. And he made him overseers of his house, and all that is he had he put into his hands. It's a story, the basic story of, of Joseph. But I'd like to also uh, step down to Joshua 24 and 15. And the scripture says, and it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord. There's a lot of people that don't want to serve God because they think it's bad. How much they don't know. How much they don't know. But he said, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Choose you this day whom ye will serve whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But I love the next part of this scripture. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve God. But as for me and my house, we are going to serve God. You know, life is full of choices. And choice, the definition of choice is just simply a selection, the act of choosing. And usually what it means is you have multiple things in front of you. You have multiple paths. You have multiple items. And it's up to you to select one of them. And, in, you know, it's kind of interesting at home. Uh, you know, everybody has your house. And... The missus decides that she wants to paint it, change the color of it. So you take her down to the local store, and then the, then the dilemma starts. Okay? You got billions of colors up there. Which one do I want? And it's a choice that has to be made. It's a choice that has to be made. The definition of the word choose is, again, to select from a number of possible alternatives to determine or decide. And believe it or not, we make hundreds, sometimes even thousands of choices today. I look at everybody in this room. Look at myself. Why did I, why did I wear a blue shirt? Sometimes a choice is made for me. My wife gets it out and says, I set a shirt out for you. Sometimes she says, wear what you want. That's a bad selection because I'll go get it. How come you pick that one? <laughs> I had a choice of ties. I wore a yellow glow blue because it kind of looked nice, but I could have wore a red, white, and blue. I could have wore all blue. I could have put on black. Each of those choices would have slightly changed the way things looked. But would have that brought the world to an end? I think not. I think not. We decide when to get up, when to take a bath, what to eat, when to eat, where to eat. All of these are choices that we make in our daily lives. Some big choices that do have uh, some major ramifications in our lives is when we decide where to live. Everybody knows I'm from, I'm from New Jersey. I came down here. I got married. I stayed in West Virginia. 
But what if my choice would have been to not even come down here? Or to come down here and go back and not marry my college sweetheart, but marry my high school sweetheart. It would have made a big difference in life. And if I would have stayed away, you wouldn't be hearing this wonderful message. <laughs> but the choices that we make affect our lives. And a lot of times the choices that we make affect other people's lives. If I would have decided to move back to New Jersey, maybe or maybe not, Missy would have married Kevin and I wouldn't have had the wonderful grandchildren that I had. Who knows what I would have had. But the choices that we make, it's up to us. We make those choices. We decide to obey the laws or not. And, you know, there are laws in the land. And some of them are not huge consequences if we don't obey them. Some of them do, like I said earlier. You know, if you exceed the speed limit, you lose a couple hundred dollars. You drive on the wrong side of the road, it may be the last time in your life you ever do it. So we make thousands and thousands of choices in our lifetime. And we have to have the consequences of them. A lot of times we make choices knowing all of the facts. We have everything laid out, and we figure out, oh, what's the best, what's the worst, and we do things. But a lot of times we make choices not knowing all of the facts. And then that's when, you know, you, you don't exactly know what happens. And then sometimes there is situations that we get into that are outside of our control. Joseph. You think Joseph wanted to go to Egypt? You think that was on his bucket list? All he wanted to do was stay with his family, have, have a good time, but his brothers decided they were going to do something. They threw him into the pit. He didn't jump into it. They threw him into it. They sold him. He, the circumstances that were, you know, he was thrown in were outside of his actual control. You know. But I'm here to tell you, you all oh, put the next slide up. Yeah. You always have a choice in every situation. Well, I didn't want to go to Egypt. I didn't have a choice. But, but how can you say that? You always, I don't care what situation you are in, you always have a choice. And what is that choice? It is your attitude. And the choice you make will make a difference. You control your attitude when it comes to a situation that you are thrown in. You may say, I had to do it. I had no choice. You always have a choice to choose your attitude. Now, when you make a decision, remember, motives matter. Behind every action, there is a motive. What, what do I want when I'm doing this? Anything in life that you decide, there is always a motive behind it. Do I want revenge or do I really want to help somebody? What is the real reason? The second thing in making a choice is don't envy. A lot of times we, we make choices about getting something because, hey, sorry, you know, you know, like we was just talking about, you know, coming, coming over to church about, you know, people buying campers. Uh, yeah, honey, let's go ahead and get that camper because so-and-so's got one. And I'm not going to get no little camper like they got. I'm just going to go ahead and get me a big fifth wheeler. And then I'm going to borrow Luke's truck to run that fifth wheeler. You know, because my little old thing ain't big enough. So we got to get bigger. Oh, honey, by the way, now we got to get a bigger house, put all this stuff in. So it's envy that leaves these choices to get bigger and bigger, okay? 2 Corinthians 4 and 18, it says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but all things which are not seen, for these things which are seen are temporal. Things that we have, things that we get, things that we, 
get in the world are strictly temporal. They don't last. When making a choice, believe. Believe what God tells you. Now, you don't have to pray to God, what color tie should I wear? But if you're going to take a job somewhere else and move out of the state, you better have God's blessing behind it. You better ask God about it. You better pray about it. Believe what God tells you and then put it to work. Pray for God's guidance. Put him first in every major decision that you make in your life. And then when making a choice, discover for yourself what it means to truly love God. To love God is to trust him. You know, we've talked a lot about faith, trust, and belief. And I believe that, that, that trust is putting your faith to work. When God says that he'll do something, he says he'll do it, trust him to do it, then believe that he will, and then do it. Psalm 71 and 5 says, For thou art my hope, O Lord God, thou art my trust from my youth. Every word of God is pure, and it's a shield for us. You know, life is full of, of ups and downs. Anybody ever live a nice, flat, smooth life and just, you know, where they say you get on that little lazy raft and just go down the river and it's all nice and smooth and you're enjoying life? We've been there, right? Everybody's ever enjoyed life? Yeah, we all have, I hope, right? But, you know, life is full of ups and downs. Ups and downs. The story about a star baseball player Ever wondered if there was going to be baseball in heaven? And then one day an angel appeared to him and said, Hey, Sam, I got good and some bad news for you. You know, there's always the good and the bad. Which one do you want first? Always good and bad. And the angel said to Sam, Yep, there is indeed baseball in heaven. And you'll get the pitch. Oh, he says, Great. What's the bad news? Oh, your first game is next Tuesday. <laughs> One Sunday morning, a mother goes up upstairs and tells her son, get up, it's time to go to church. I'm not going. Ever heard that? I'm not going. And why not, she answers. I don't want to. What choice did he want to make? Well, just give me two reasons why not. Now, you've all been there, right? Just give me two reasons why not. Well, one, none, nobody over there likes me. And two, I don't like any of them. Well, she answers, ah, and then he said, ha, ah, I'll just give you two reasons why you should go. Number one, you're 47 years old, and number two, you're the pastor. <laughs> so, folks, I'm going to give you the bad news first. You know, I said life's full of ups and downs. You always get good news, bad news. And I'm going to give you the bad news first. Just get it out of the way. If the bottom hasn't fallen out of your life, it will. And if you've already experienced major problems and finally getting ahead, don't relax. More will come. Folks, that is the way life is. That is the way life is. We don't like it, but that is life. We lived in a messed up world. It's messed up by sins, by sin, and I'm going to tell you, just because you're in church, just because you're filled with the Holy Ghost does not mean you are exempt from life. That is not going to happen. You are not exempt. You don't have a special exemption. But I am to tell you one thing. We have a God that will get us through 
anything. We have a God that will get us through anything. God loves us. God loves us. You ever been in an obstacle race? Anybody ever been in an obstacle race? Yeah, years ago. Okay. What's one of the first things you do? You take a look and see what's out there, then you try to figure out how to, to get past the obstacle. And I'm telling you, sometimes they look pretty tough. Sometimes they look pretty tough. And then we, in our minds, look, say, there's no way I can get over that, around that, through that, under that, however. But I'm here to tell you there is a God's love is greater than any obstacle that will ever be thrown into our lives. Let's bring up Romans 8, 38. I love this scripture. It says, for I am persuaded. I could teach a whole lesson just on that. What does per I am persuaded mean? Convinced. Okay. But I believe it's even more than that. I am convinced without a doubt that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come. Boy, I tell you, that covers a lot of territory. I mean, it, it's almost like one of them big legalistic things, you know, says this, 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 this. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, or things to come, or th nor height, nor depth, or any other creature. So I am convinced without a single doubt that there is nothing out there that will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That is what we have to have in our minds as we go through life. That will get you through any obstacle, any situation, good or bad. Be persuaded that there is nothing out there that's going to be able to separate you from the love of God. So let's take a look at a bad situation. We have, we've already covered some of it. Joseph, 17 years old, all right, 17-year-old kid. Don't you wish to be 17 again? <laughs> no. <laughs> 17 years old. And what happened to him? Sold into slavery by his own brothers, moved to a foreign land, and then when he was there, he was falsely accused by a married woman and then thrown into prison. And you talk about being in the pits. Now, when you get into situations like that, there's several things that he could have done. He could have escaped, looked for a way out, act like a prisoner of war. I'm only going to give you as little information as possible, but always looking for a way out. He could have made trouble. Stirred up stuff, made trouble. The quickest way to get out is to get thrown out. Make them wish that they'd never brought you here. Complain. Oh, we do this one well, don't we? Complain. Well, let me tell you something about complaining. Complaining. It's only going to make you miserable. Half the time, the people around you don't listen. And then I'll tell you, if you do it a lot, like some people, people don't even want to be around you. Complain. You're going to be miserable. I'm going to make everybody else around me the same way. Do as little as possible. This is one that some people do down at work. They get thrown into a job they don't like, so they do what is known as destructive obedience. Ever heard that term? Destructive obedience. I will do exactly what you tell me, nothing more, nothing less. That's it. Oh, I didn't know you wanted me to type that. You said write down, you know. 
It's all anxious, destructive obedience. Only work when the boss is looking. We've done that. It's not good. And then the last thing, manipulate and get what you can. Try to change situations. Go ahead and work hard, but you're only doing it if there's something in it for you. And how many times do we do? We try these things when we get into situations that we don't want to be in. Five options, most common things that people do when they're in bad situations. But there's two things wrong with them. Number one, they're unscriptural. And number two, they don't work. They don't work. Escape. We want to get out of a bad situation. We get a teacher we don't like. We run to the principal and we want to drop the class. We get a job we don't like, we quit. When we have a problem in our marriage, we get out of it. When we don't like what's going on in church, we hop to another one. What's the saying? You ever find a perfect church the day you attend? It's no longer perfect. Think about that. We say life has no meaning, and we burn, when we burn our brains with drugs and alcohol trying to escape the realities of life, it's not going to work. Escape is never the answer. Never the answer. More often than not, the circumstance is not the real problem. Making trouble. And this kind of person is, is described in Proverbs. Proverbs 26, 27 says, whoever diggeth a pit. You're making trouble. Digging a pit. Whoever diggeth a pit shall fall therein. And he that rolleth a stone, it will be returned upon him. Yes, making trouble will sometimes get you out of the frying pan into the proverbial fire. Complain. We only make you miserable, and people will start ignoring you. And let me tell you, folks, complaining, nobody listens. They may say they are, but in reality, I mean, we've all been there. We've had people come to us. We've had people to complain, and when they finally leave, they go, boy, I'm glad they're gone. And then how many, you ever, have you ever, how many of you have ever stayed up at night worrying about what somebody complained to you about? We forget it. We just let it go. We have enough problems of our own. And doing as little as possible and manipulating, these are self-centered ways of trying to escape. It's egotistical. Oh, I can do this, and I can do that, and I can figure a way out. You only bet wind up with a bad situation. So what do we do? I said before, we have a choice. Every situation we're in, we do have choices. But you need to remember to choose to serve. Serve God. Serve God. Joseph chose to serve a stranger in a strange land because of his devotion to God. And what happened? His servitude paid off. He prospered. Genesis 39, verses 2 through 4, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. He could have done all this other stuff, but he chose to serve God and continue to church serve God. And God honored that, and he prospered. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord made him all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph what? And Joseph found grace in his sight. And he served him, and he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. 
quit there, didn't want to be there, but decided to serve God, and he prospered. No matter what you are facing today, whether life is peaceful or chaotic, I'm here to tell you, folks, there is nowhere that you can go that God can't be there. You know, we have kids. They play a little tiny game. It was called hide and seek. And they look around, and they try to find some place that they can run and and whoever is the, the finder can't find them. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it won't. You know, especially with little kids that can't be fine, they start giggling, you know. But there, I'm telling you, folks, there is absolutely nowhere that you can go that God won't be there. That he will not be there. He will always be in your presence. Romans 8.31 says, And... Shall we say unto these things, if God be for us, who can be against us? You say, well, life is against me. Life is this. Life is that. But God is always for you. Always for you. Psalms 139 and 7 it says, Whether shall I go from thy spirit, and whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I lay my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take my wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even down shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. God will always be there for you. We have choices to make. We get in situations we have choices to make. The main choice you must make is stick with God. Stick with God. He will always be there for you. And then as we make these choices, remember, when life is over, it matters. Okay? When life is over, it matters. Not how much you've got, but how much you have given. It matters not how much you have won, but how much you have done. It matters not how much you have saved, but how much you have given. It matters not how much you have been honored, but how much you have loved and served. Too many times we get life matters mixed up. And it's important to choose many things. It is. It really is. It is important to choose a good job. It is important to choose the right job, the right spouse, the right place to live. It is important to choose your work ethic. But the most important choice in your life is serving God. The single most important life. I said it. I don't know if it's ever written anywhere. It's my whole family knows it because I tell them all the time. God first. God first. Family second. And then everything else just falls in its place. But you must serve God. You know, bad choices on this earth can often be corrected. It can. We make bad financial decisions, and we go broke, we, we go bankrupt, things like that. You know, you look at all these people worth all these billions of dollars. Some of them have filed bankruptcy, I don't know how many times. They've made bad choices, they lose it all, but from that they learn, and then they go on. But they can be worked out. Marriages can be saved. Addictions can be overcome. That's all doable. But you know, a bad choice concerning salvation and eternity cannot be corrected after it's made. When you leave this world, however it's going to be, when you leave this world, that choice 
I'm going to use the phrase, is set in stone. Cannot be changed. Your outcome begins. Joshua 24 and 15, I'll bring this up again. The end of the scripture. Let's go to the end of it. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Can everybody in here say that? Can you honestly stand up in a mirror and look at that and point yourself, point to yourself in a mirror and say, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Are you willing to serve God? Let's bring up the choices. Shows a door. You know, behind that door, when it comes to eternity, one of those doors leads to hell, and one of them leads to heaven. Are you willing to serve God? Are you willing to decide in your life to do his will? You have the choice. Yes or no? Let's bring up the last song. The choice is yours. It's your choice. I cannot make that choice for you. You cannot make that choice for anyone else. You make the choice on your own. The choice is yours. And yes, it does make a difference. It does make a difference. Let's all stand. God is wonderful. I made a choice. Um, you know, it, my mind slips me how even how long ago it was back in the 70s. I had made a choice to serve God. Best choice I ever made. And it's one that we all need to make. Let's all bow our heads in prayer. God, we thank you, Lord, for this time to be in your house. We thank you, Lord, for each and every one that's here. We thank you, Lord, for your saving mercy. And we thank you, God, that you're always going to be with us and help us through each and everything that we do. We ask, God, as we go from this place, that you go with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.